Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the award ceremony and webinar for the 2021 ASEAN Korea Academic Essay Contest. My name is Sarah Lim from the ASEAN Korea Center, and I will be your MC for today. I am pleased to share with you that today we have about 50 participants with us, both the winners and participants of the essay contest, as well as some of the members of the ASEAN Youth Network in Korea. So thank you for joining, and a big welcome to all of you. So to give you a short introduction of our program, the ASEAN Korea Academic Essay Contest is an annual program organized by the ASEAN Korea Center since 2016. Our key objective through this contest is to raise the awareness and deepen your understanding of ASEAN-Korea partnership. Moreover, we hope that as you carry out your research, you will gain greater interest in ASEAN-Korea relations and also continue your studies in this field. This year, we were happy to receive 129 essays of which 10 will be awarded today. At this time, to begin our celebrations, I would like to invite His Excellency Kim Hae-yong, the Secretary General of the ASEAN Korea Center for his welcoming remarks. Dear guests and winners and online viewers, uh, good afternoon. It is uh, with great pleasure for me to welcome everyone to today's award ceremony and webinar for the 2021 ASEAN Korea Academic Essay Contest. As we are still unable to meet everyone physically, uh, we gather today virtually to congratulate the winners of this year's contest. Taking this opportunity, uh, please allow me to convey my heartfelt gratitude to the support Extended, to, uh, extended by our partner organizations, the Seoul National University uh, Asia Center, the University of Brunei Darussalam, and Korea Association of Southeast Asian Studies. Also, this year's contest would not be successful without the continuing support of the ASEAN Secretariat, the ASEAN Foundation, the ASEAN University Network, as well as the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The ASEAN Korea Center continued to organize the essay contest as a platform to motivate of, uh, our young generation to expand their knowledge and awareness of the ASEAN Korea partnership. It is also aimed towards academically engaging them to share their perspective on its future relations. Despite the need to change the format uh, to online due to the pandemics, the center is very happy to see the unwavering interest and enthusiasm shown by the students of our reason. This year, a total of 129 essays were received from university students of all 10 ASEAN countries and the Republic of Korea. Students wrote on three different themes. The first theme was on the role of youth in promoting mutual understanding between ASEAN and Korea towards a sustainable and future-oriented ASEAN-Korea partnership. The second theme was on strengthening ASEAN-Korea partnership in overcoming COVID-19 and building back better for great prosperity in the region. Finally, the third theme, which was incorporated in commemoration of the Mekong Korea Exchange Year, was on strengthening ASEAN-Korea cooperation in mitigating the impact of climate change and promoting sustainable development in the Mekong region. As we went over the essays, there was no doubt the students had exerted an incredible amount of time, energy, and effort for this contest. Many of them showcased great ideas and thoughts on ways to develop a more mutually beneficial ASEAN-Korea partnership. Today, to further congratulate the winners, the center 
uh, is pleased to invite two prominent experts, Mr. Abhichai Sunchinda and Ambassador Jung Hamun, who will share with us their extensive knowledge about ASEAN and Korea. I hope uh, today's recognition and today's lecture will further motivate and encourage you to continue your interest in exploring and learning about ASEAN-Korea relations. Once again, big congratulations to all our winners and also my sincere appreciation goes out to all those who have participated in the contest this year. I hope that today's event will be rewarding for all of you and you will continue to take part in shaping a more agile and robust partnership between ASEAN and Korea. I wish all of you the very best in your future endeavors. Most of all, stay safe and healthy. I thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Moving on, we would like to invite two professors from our evaluation panel who will provide us with a brief overview of their evaluations. First, please welcome Professor Che Su Hong from Seoul National University. Professor, the screen is yours. Uh, congratulations, all the prize, uh, prize winners uh, for Honorable Korean ASEAN Center Academic Essay co Contest. I'm Su Hong Che, uh, Professor Teaching Anthropology and Southeast Asian Culture at Seoul National, U Seoul National U University. I'm also uh, a, a director of Southeast Asian Center at uh, uh, Seoul National University. As a so-called uh, South, Southeast Asianist uh, who has been studying and practicing for the in enhancement of the cooperation between Korea and ASEAN countries, I was happy to review and evaluate all the essays you submitted. Generally speaking, most of the papers I reviewed are wonderful, much more than I had expected. Uh, they are well organized, insightful, and persuasive. Uh, especially the awarded papers are excellent, so much as I cannot uh, believe this, these are written mostly by undergraduate students. Your paper deals with crucial points that are necessary to understand the realities nowadays and seek for future strategies for Korean ASEAN uh, cooperations in terms of sustainable development at Mekong region, the role of youth and post pandemic activities. However, there were two things I thought uh, uh, it should have been better if the applicants did these things. First of all, there were two lengthy summary of what you have already known. Uh, it was boring to read the same explanations on background and histories of Korean ASEAN cooperations. Uh, uh, it was a little bit painful for me. <laughs> mm. Uh, especially overemphasizing and praising the achievement of Korean, uh, uh, Korean government's new southern, uh, new, new southern you know, the policy again and again. I believe that it might have been better for you to shorten the summary and uh, excessive compliments of Korean ASEAN relationship and allow uh, more spaces for the critical discussion of the problems and suggestions for the future relationship. Related to the first point, secondly, I expected more ASEAN-centered perspectives in your essays. Most of them are from ASEAN countries, right? Uh, uh, I believe that the ASEAN-specific specific understanding and viewpoint viewpoints of the cooperative relationship between Korea and ASEAN countries are important more than anything else. Uh, 
while, uh, while attempting to respect both Korean and ASEAN countries' interests equally, equally, all the papers are too diplomatically balanced. This kind of perfectly uh, balanced cooperation is too ideal, even though we are, we are accustomed to use the term mutually benefiting. Uh, the reason I dare to put this point is that you are a college student, not a diplomat, who can raise more courageous and critical arguments. You are entitled to make an attempt to cross a line and by that, challenge the customary perspectives and suggest more creative points. This does not mean that your papers have flaws and problems. As I mentioned early, your papers are superb as a work of undergraduate student. What I'm trying to emphasize is that you are the future of the Korean ASEAN cooperation and you need to be more creative and critical. Uh, once more, many congratulations for your awarding. Hope all of you have enjoyed, have, um, have enjoyed uh, this time and deserve uh, to be proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Siti Mazida Mohamed from the University of Brunei Darussalam. Dr. Mazida, the screen is yours. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Siti Mazida, uh, an assistant professor of geography, environment and development from University of Brunei Darussalam. Thank you to the ASEAN Korea Center uh, for inviting me to assess the 2021 ASEAN Korea As Academic Essay Contest and this opportunity to say a few words on the 30 essay submissions we received this year. First of all, I would like to, I want to congratulate all the participants on your essay submission across the three themes. Uh, theme one, the role of youth in promoting mutual understanding between ASEAN and Korea, in short. Uh, theme two, strengthening ASEAN-Korea partnership in overcoming COVID-19. Theme three, strengthening ASEAN-Korea cooperation in mitigating the impact of climate change and promoting sustainable development in the Mekong region. As a youth geographer, um, a researcher who studies youth mobilities and their everyday social spatial practices and engagements on various social media platforms, I was particularly pleased to see the potential uh, youth engagements in promoting mutual understanding between ASEAN and Korea, not just via this um, academic contest, but also via those uh, recommendations you gave uh, in your own um, submission for the first team, especially. Examples given include the different forms of youth social culture exchanges, the use of digital, the use of digital technologies such as social media, youth as influencers, and the role of educational um, institutions in supporting the promotion of mutual understanding between ASEAN and Korea. Overall, the essays have offered solid context of the current situation and the relationships between ASEAN and Korea, the challenges and limitations discussed, and the suggestions offered are uh, valid and interesting. One of the arguments emphasized in most of these essays that actually caught my attention was the apparent imbalance in the ASEAN-Korea relationship that needs to be tackled further. So this recommendation, I think, should assist in developing the current mutual understanding between ASEAN-Korea and strengthen um, our relationship further. Of course, there are areas of improvement as uh, the previous assessor has mentioned. However, I am personally inspired by your originality, your arguments and recommendations and the high quality of work you submitted. Um, I learned a lot from them, to be honest. I was quite excited to, to read all of them. I hope to see these recommendations uh, could be realized in the near future. So it shouldn't be just on paper, but something that can be done uh, by the youth for uh, strengthening the relationship between uh, ASEAN and uh, Korea. So once again, congratulations to all 30 teams, especially the 10 teams that won the prizes and were awarded the special recognition. Congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Now, without further ado, let's get right into the award ceremony. 10 essays will be awarded today. There will be one grand prize, two second prizes, two third prizes, and five essays will receive special recognition. 
After the announcement of the winners, a short video presentation will be made on the winning essays, which our winners have sent us last week. We will begin with the five winning teams that will be awarded with the special recognition prize. Each winning team will receive a certificate and cash prize of 500,000 Korean won, which is over 400 US dollars. So, here are the five winners. Mr. Zepeng Tang and Mr. Jun Hao Wong from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Ms. Harizawati Tahir and Ms. Adila Masro from National University of Malaysia. Ms. Tim Rakna from Royal University of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Mr. Lee Jong Sung from Jungang University and Ms. Cho So Bin from Sungyungan University in Korea. And Ms. Lee Wee An, Mr. Lee Wee An, and Mr. Muhammad Mahmoud from the University of Brunei Darussalam. Congratulations! We will now take a moment to learn about their essays in the short video. Hi, my name is Zepeng from Singapore, and my partner is Jin Hao, who is also from Singapore. Uh, we are from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. So the title of our essay is The Emerging Korean Leadership on Sustainability in the Mekong. And the objective of our essay is to expound on novel ways for the ROK to coordinate and even lead efforts in three main areas. First, in regional R&D efforts for sustainability and development issues. Second, in the development of the green uh, industrial sector. And third, in parking gaps in existing regional cooperation frameworks, such as the Mekong River Commission. In regional R&D efforts, we argue that the ROK can position themselves as a benign power to help to accelerate green R&D efforts in the Mekong. These efforts can take the form of a ROK Mekong Green R&D Alliance. And on green industrial development, we think that the ROK can tap on its comparative advantage and strong track record in green investments to lend the Mekong states a helping hand in their domestic green industrial growth. And finally, on supplementing gaps in existing regional cooperation frameworks, we believe that the ROK can aid Mekong states in achieving the MRC study council recommendations and also to use uh, the ROK's comparative advantage in biomass energy to improve uh, bioenergy capabilities in the Mekong. So that's all from us. Thank you so much. <music> and my partner Siti Nur Adila Binti Masro. We both studied East Asian Studies at the National University of Malaysia. The title of our essay is Strengthening ASEAN-Korea Partnership in Overcoming COVID-19 Challenges and SP Beyond the Pandemic. Our essay highlights the importance of global health diplomacy and foreign policies in making health diplomacy among nations to work, with the NSP being the catalyst between ASEAN and Korea. The pandemic has actually taught ASEAN and Korea that they can manage any global health issues if they do it together. This essay also emphasized the strategies of both partners in developing post-pandemic recovery plans. Most ASEAN member states lack financial capabilities and expertise in high technology facilities to manage COVID-19. So with the help of Korea's expertise, ASEAN member states can learn and do much more. Therefore, we believe that having Korea as a trustworthy and reliable partner, Korea and ASEAN can build a more resilient and inclusive future together. Moving forward, the global health diplomacy and green recovery will be the new norm of strengthening diplomatic relations between ASEAN and Korea. Thank you. This is Ajina Tim from Cambodia. Thank you for having me and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this year's academic essay contest. In my essay, I have had the opportunity to learn more about the Republic of Korea and Mekong partnership in terms of um, combating the climate change disaster in the region. The Mekong region 
is home to over 300 million people across Southeast Asia and it has blessed us with such diverse ecological features, human resources, and natural disaster. However, the, the region is facing such impending climate change disaster that need immediate attention. Regional and international partnership has always been playing a crucial role in mitigating those problems. The Republic of Korea has always been a loyal partner to the Mekong region, and it can contribute to the development of the Mekong region into one of the biggest development centers in the world as well. In my essay, I explore more about the development in the Mekong region, the role that South Korea has been playing, and the impending disaster the region has been facing, as well as what potential contribution that the partnership between Mekong and the Republic of Korea can bring into the near future. Thank you again for having me. Greetings, my name is Jong Sung Lee. Our paper is entitled Strengthening ASEAN-Korea Cooperation in Mitigating the Impact of Climate Change and Promoting Sustainable Development in the Mekong Region, written by Jong Sung Lee, Chungang University, College of Medicine, and So Vin Cho, Sung Yung University, College of Medicine. Throughout this paper, we have examined the ways that Korea and ASEAN can strengthen cooperation. We aim to seek solutions in three areas, environment, economy, and diplomacy. In the area of environment, Korea and ASEAN can support Mekong countries by sharing human resources and promoting mutual research projects for climate action policy, natural phenomenon forecasting system, and clean water supply through seawater desalination. In addition, in terms of economy, South Korea and ASEAN can promote business infrastructure investment projects and build a border economic zone and organize multilateral platform to pass on the strategy of South Korea's successful economic development. Furthermore, in the area of diplomacy, South Korea and ASEAN can support the Mekong countries to take a favorable position in the competition of water resources and to achieve balance between development and the preservation of environment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lee Wee An. And my name is Muhammad Azim bin Mahmoud. We are from Brunei. The title of our essay is The Role of Youth in Promoting Mutual Understanding Between Asian and Korea Towards a Sustainable and Future-Oriented Asian-Korea Partnership. Like the title, we wanted to briefly explore how youth can be the bridge between Asian countries and Korea partnership. Just for context, young Koreans' understanding of the region is limited, but not vice versa. In this essay, we go through the components for an effective partnership. Then, we go through how youth can become ambassadors alongside the tools such as internet and physical activities such as student exchange program. This essay will also discuss how innovation and entrepreneurship are also components in an effective partnership and how youth can be grassroots innovators to achieve partnership goals. Lastly, this essay will briefly explain how youth as students contribute to longer lasting partnership and furthermore, discuss the more unseen benefits in internship, collaborative research, and cultural activities and study programs in promoting mutual understanding between Korea and ASEAN. Thank you. And I hope all of you enjoy the presentations. As the officer in charge of this program, I read through all of your papers and I'm pleased to say that I enjoyed reading them all. And I think your short presentations really grasp the essence of the essays. If any of you would like to read the full paper, be informed that we will be uploading the winning papers on our website. Now, let us move on to the third prize. Winners will receive a certificate and a cash prize of 1 million Korean won. So, here are the two winners. Ms. Wang Tui and Ms. Ha Fong from National Economics University of Vietnam, and Ms. Claire Lim from Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Congratulations on your excellent achievements. Now, let's take a look at their presentations. My 
name is Ngoc Thuy. Hello, I'm Hà Phương and we are from Vietnam. The title of our essay is Strengthening the Mekong-Korea Cooperation, Promoting the Synergy Among Mekong Cooperative Mechanisms on Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Towards Sustainable Development. In the rise of climate change issues and the COP26 conference held in 2021, and as being one of the most affected uh, economies by climate change, we think that the Mekong subregion, uh, with many cooperative mechanisms, needs to find effective ways to respond. Our paper aims to make some implications from the Mekong Korea mechanism to uh, coordinate and supplement with other Mekong cooperative ones as a way to uh, ensure the success of them in uh, response to climate change. To address that, we first draw some outstanding points of climate change in the Mekong subregion. Uh, then we make clear the concept of synergy and uh, discuss gaps in uh, coordination and complementarity among all the Mekong cooperative mechanisms. We also analyze the uh, synergy opportunities and challenges uh, for the Mekong Korea mechanism. Finally, we hope that this paper will contribute to raise the demand of collaboration uh, for climate change in Mekong subregion. Hi all, my name is Claire and I am from Singapore. My essay is titled Strengthening ASEAN-Korea Cooperation in Mitigating the Impact of Climate Change and Promoting Sustainable Development in the Mekong region. The Mekong region has been described to be the lifeblood of riparian Southeast Asian states and with a widespread impact on the development of the ASEAN region as a whole. Ensuring sustainable development is therefore one of the key priorities for the Mekong region in the coming decade. However, due to climate change and the increase in man-made infrastructure, Mekong's unique ecosystem is facing a slew of environmental problems. Many countries have intervened to provide aid in this area. However, as various countries step in to provide developmental assistance, a new layer of geopolitical challenges has started to emerge in the backdrop. Upon understanding the key challenges in the Mekong region, I will conduct an analysis on the position and strategic interests of key developmental aid providers to understand their motivations behind developmental assistance. This will provide a better idea of how ASEAN and South Korea can position themselves as the key drivers of sustainable development in the region. The paper will then discuss opportunities for South Korea and ASEAN to collaborate on providing developmental assistance. Such areas include leveraging on South Korea's technological expertise and expanding ASEAN's role in providing developmental as assistance to the Mekong region. Thank you. Thank you again for your valuable contributions. All right, next up is our second prize winners. The winners will receive a certificate and cash prize of 1.5 million Korean won, which is about 1,200 US dollars. So here we go. This is a multinational team from London School of Economics, Mr. Hyung Ju Jung and Ms. Hana Chia, representing Korea and Singapore and Ms. Anissa Pratamasari from Korea University, representing Indonesia. Congratulations! It is indeed nice to see Korean and Singaporean students working together on this contest, and also to see an Indonesian student studying in Korea taking part in this contest. Your participation captures the very spirit of this program. So, without further ado, let us see your presentations. Hi everyone, my name is Hyungju and I'm from South Korea. I'm Hannah and I'm from Singapore. The title of our essay is A Tale of Two Locales, Cross-Cultural Perceptions and Misunderstandings Between ASEAN and the Republic of Korea. Our thesis finds that there are actually deep-rooted issues um, that stem from societal attitudes that are deeply embedded in both societies. And in order to address such issues, we find it necessary to change and reshape social attitudes themselves. So in the first part of our essay, 
we analyze current problems between youth in youth relationships between ASEAN and South Korea. Um, we looked at it from the perspective of cultural appropriation, and we assess the limitations of current youth events between the two locales. Yeah, in our second part of our essay, we explored the ways in which we can then therefore tackle these asymmetries in mutual cultural understanding. And we find this to be twofold. Firstly, would be reshaping social attitudes. And this can be achieved through discursive uh, action, especially by mobilizing online platforms. And the second way is to thicken inter-societal and cross-cultural interactions through um, international platforms such as transnational youth organizations, as well as informal means like online sub-communities. Hi everyone, my name is Anisa from Indonesia. For this contest, I submitted my essay titled Building Partnership in Overcoming COVID-19 Through City Diplomacy, the Cases of Sister Cities and Sister Provinces between Indonesia and Korea. Through this essay, I wanted to highlight about the roles of cities and provinces in relations between states. These kinds of relations have been overshadowed by state-to-state -state diplomacy. Even though city and province diplomacy usually hold a more routine and somewhat deeper cooperation than the state level. I mean, how many of us know that my hometown, Surabaya and Busan, have conducted cultural and economical exchange to the point that there is a Surabaya Gill in Busan. I bet like, no, not many people know that. And in related to the pandemic era, I argue that these cities and provinces can cut off the diplomacy complexity between state in terms of like bureaucracy so they can cooperate at a faster rate, especially in sending medical aids that are much needed by the developing countries like Indonesia. And there are evidences from the, like for, ex for example, the aid from Seoul to Jakarta, its sister city, the late Seoul Mayor Park won soon immediately sent testing machines to enhance the testing capacity in to Jakarta. Or there are also several mask aid from several Korean provinces to the sisters in Indonesia. So that's why in the in the case of city diplomacy, I hope that this kind of cooperation can be strengthened further in ASEAN, ASEAN and Korea partnership, and some someday it could go beyond just medical aids in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Okay, now for the grand prize. The winners will be receiving a certificate and a grand sum of 2.5 million Korea won. After a very competitive evaluation process, I'm happy to announce that the grand prize goes to Ms. Sophia Malian and Ms. Alisa Dalison from the University of Asia and the Pacific of the Philippines. Congratulations! <laughs> this team wrote on theme one, which is on the role of the youth in promoting mutual understanding between ASEAN and Korea towards a sustainable and future-oriented ASEAN-Korea partnership. The title of the winning essay is Ready, Set, Action? the role of digital media tools in harnessing youth power for greater cultural understanding. Before we call them to the screen, let us first watch this short clip about their essay. Good day, I'm Sophia Maolyon. And I'm Alisa Dalisa. We are both political economy students from the Philippines. And we wrote a paper entitled Ready, Set, Action, the role of digital media tools in harnessing youth power for greater cultural understanding. Our paper was inspired by the need for stronger mutual cultural ties between ASEAN countries and South Korea, especially as widespread misconceptions have led to a look firm and unfair perception of their relationship. With this, we sought to explore the role of the increasingly dynamic and active youth sector and the enabling power of digital media tools to forward citizen diplomacy measures that can foster greater cultural understanding between the two parties. To do so, we utilized a three-dimensional framework that assesses the effect of media tools and diplomacy, particularly through agenda setting, presence expansion, and conversation generation. 
This corresponds to the three main cultural competencies of awareness, familiarity, and practice. From here, our paper discussed the role of the youth as active users and influencers of the digital space in highlighting the prevalence of cultural misrepresentation, generating better social cultural awareness, and promoting a more empathetic dialogue among the citizens of the two parties. We particularly recommend the creation of a culturally neutral framework that can guide policies, projects, and programs as well as the adoption of a more purposive, interactive method in educating and empowering our youth in culture and governance issues. Through our paper, we hope to shed light on how we can better mobilize the youth sector in strengthening ASEAN Korea relationships in the future. All right, at this time, we will invite Ms. Sophia to share a few words on behalf of all the winners. Sophia, the screen is yours. Hello, good afternoon. On behalf of my partner, Alisa Camille Dalazon, our mentor, Ms. Clara Visconde, and all the winners and participants of the 2021 ASEAN Korea Academic Essay Contest, we would like to extend our appreciation to the ASEAN Korea Center for providing us the opportunity to pitch in our ideas and engage us in this very important conversation on cultural understanding and greater international cooperation. The past two years of COVID-19 have taught us the importance of standing strong together to overcome the adversities and challenges of our time. This is a call to us youth to work together and ensure that no one is left behind as we move forward. As we enter a new era of recovery, we hope for a stronger relationship between ASEAN countries and Korea one that is built on mutual understanding, respect, and trust. As what this competition also symbolizes, we hope for greater opportunities for the youth to exercise our role as active influencers of our community. With this, we are very honored to partake in this esteemed competition alongside the leaders and scholars of our generation who heeded the call to understand how we can foster a more sustainable and prosperous partnership. Thank you again to the Center for helping us realize our role as catalysts and gearing us to take action to build a more empathetic and culturally sensitive environment. We look forward to ready, set action with all of you. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Once again, congratulations to all of our winners. Before we move on to the special lectures, we will take a group photo. I'd like to remind all of you to switch on your cameras. Let me also invite the Secretary General of the Secretary General and Ambassador Chong to come up to the stage. Three, two, one, smile. One more. Three, two, one, smile. <laughs> okay, good. In line with the themes for our contest this year, we are very fortunate to have two esteemed experts who will be sharing their expertise with us on issues and challenges in the Mekong region, as well as on the cooperation between ASEAN and Korea to overcome the current pandemic. And here are some housing rules, house, housekeeping rules. After each speaker's presentation, there will be a Q&A session for about 10 minutes. For those who want to ask questions, you may check the hand raising button of the screen during the Q&A session. When, when you're checking the um, screen, you may see the icons and you can raise the tiny little hand to show that the presenter that you have a question. And make sure that um, you, you need to identify who is asking the question. So, Without further ado, let us now begin with the first special lecture. Our first speaker, Mr. Apichai Sunchinda, is a development specialist and was previously the executive director for the ASEAN Foundation. He has held positions with the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand and the various international development agencies which are Bangkok-based. He also spent a significant part of his professional career for the ASEAN Secretariat and ASEAN Foundation. Today, 
He will be sharing with us some of the issues and challenges faced by the Mekong countries, as well as his insights on the development of international cooperation in the sub-region. With that, let us welcome Mr. Apichai Sunchinda to the screen. So Mr. Apichai, you have 20 minutes for the lecture and 10 minutes for Q&A. You may begin whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd thank, like to thank the Asian Korea Center too uh, for this opportunity to speak to everyone uh, on this webinar. And congratulations to the, you know, the winners and also those all participants in the essay contest. All right. Um, hey, uh, I would uh, like to just touch on the Mekong sub-regional cooperation uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, can I have the slide? Okay, uh, I think some of you who have written about uh, the Mekong theme uh, would already know many of these uh, different frameworks. There are at least about a dozen or more uh, intergovernmental cooperation framework in the Mekong sub-region, uh, as far as uh, uh, I can count them. Uh, some dating back as far as, you know, maybe 60, 70 years ago, uh, the Mekong River Commission is one of them, although in those days it was only known as the Mekong or the Interim Mekong Committee, right? So that was the first uh, among the, the, the intergovernmental cooperation frameworks. Uh, and then in the 90s, you have some from the ASEAN and together with China, you have the Greater Mekong Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation Program, GMS, uh, which is of course facilitated by the Asian Development Bank or ADB. Uh, and then uh, most of the rest have sort of emerged over the last uh, two decades only. Huh? from about 1999, 2000 onwards. And you, I don't need to go through the list. I think you can see it on the screen. Uh, and, uh, but the, since I have been working with ASEAN, I try to group it under some, you know, cons sort of configuration of ASEAN, whether it's ASEAN 3, ASEAN 4, ASEAN 5, ASEAN 10, okay? Uh, because to me, these are all sort of constellation or sub-constellation or subsets of ASEAN, all right? Uh, in the Mekong primarily, yeah? They're more, in fact, uh, the five uh, uh, mainland Southeast Asian countries uh, who are Mekong countries are actually all member states of ASEAN, okay? So half of ASEAN is in the Mekong. Okay, can I have the next slide? Okay, so what are some of the challenges? I think uh, some of your essays probably have touched on them, but anyway, I'd just like to run through it quickly. Uh, you know, all these a dozen or more cooperation frameworks, by the way, these are just the intergovernmental ones. Yeah, There are also many, many other project program oriented ones, which I am not even touching on. So there are actually many, many, many uh, players in the Mekong already. <clears throat> But then uh, my general observation is, unfortunately, each of them are sort of operating in silo independently, okay? There's not enough uh, consultation coordination among these different frameworks. A lot of them have overlaps, and there are also some missing gaps between them, okay? Uh, and each sector area is just sort of treated as its own uh, without much consideration of its interaction, interrelations with other pertinent areas. So next type of cross-sector analysis, such as water, energy, food, climate, and climate, uh, which are now becoming very important, uh, hopefully uh, uh, would uh, you know, bring a new fresh breath air because right now it's still quite rare to find such nexus uh, projects or programs. And most of them, they are confined to national or sub-national levels yeah, because being projects oriented. And there are very little that are sort of really truly transboundary or cross national in nature. A few, but not many. And so as a result, most of them are piecemeal. They are seldom provide a big picture analysis that we, we really need now in order to deal with some of these uh, different uh, sectors and uh, interacting of the sectors. And then as somebody has already pointed out, the ongoing geopolitical rivalry and contestation within the Mekong sub region among the major powers is complicating the situation and therefore hampering the closer cooperation development of cost-effective synergistic complementary and win-win arrangements. Okay, next slide, please. But then on the other hand, what are the opportunities? Uh, some efforts are being made now to address these kind of nexus or cross-cutting uh, issues. 
notably within the Mekong River Commission, uh, which was mentioned earlier, and also the Mekong Institute, which is an, also another intergovernmental organization but based in Thailand, uh, but addresses the, the Mekong related uh, you know, uh, issues uh, and is uh, comprising of six member countries, uh, namely the five Mekong in uh, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, plus China in this case. So it has the same sort of configuration as the GMS, for example, uh, or, or the Lanchan Mekong Corporation. Okay, then there's also increasing realization among concerned parties to transboundary nature problems, uh, where there's environment, where there's transnational crime or trade or digital or whatever you want to name it. It's, it's all very, very much cross-sectoral and transnational these days. And increasingly some like MRC and MI are taking up these kind of nexus issues. Uh, the Mekong US uh, partnership, uh, you know, which is another framework, which is among the dozen, they have attempted through what they call a Friends of the Mekong Forum uh, to initiate some form of consultation among the relevant partners. But one significant Me Mekong River Iberian member country which is absent in this is China. So it's not a complete in my view. Uh, but then on the other hand, the Chinese led Lanch and Mekong Corporation is essentially open to engagement with some other parties such as ASEAN, MRC and GMS, but again, not the others. So there's not, no sort of a comprehensive, uh, all-inclusive kind of framework, uh, which includes all the relevant partners or parties. Now, interestingly, Japan and China have held up to five meetings over the past decade on the policy dialogue nature on Mekong sub-regional issues, but apparently I don't see very much, you know, tangible outcomes. And I guess maybe that's a reflection of the often strained bilateral relations be between these two countries. Now, interestingly, ASEAN leaders at their summit in October 2013 in Brunei Darussalam, in the chairman's statement, have actually, uh, uh, you know, made a very interesting statement and observation by saying that they recognize the importance of preserving, managing, and sustainable use of water resources in the region. And in quote, including assessing impacts that economic development has on the environment and people's livelihoods in major river basins, including the lower Mekong Basin. So they, the ASEAN leaders themselves have taken note of this importance of the Mekong Basin in their statement back, you know, uh, eight years ago. Uh, and recently, uh, last year, when Vietnam was chairing ASEAN uh, in 2020, they actually uh, brought in the sub-regional dimension, uh, meaning including the Mekong, although there are also other sub-regional frameworks within uh, ASEAN, like for example, the IMTGT, or the Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand uh, Growth Triangle. Uh, and then there's also the BIM IAGA, which is the Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines sort of a growth area, okay? So all these are included uh, parts of sub-regional configuration of ASEAN. Okay, so Vietnam decided to address this in uh, last year when they were chairing us. They convened some kind of a workshop and forum. And more recently, in August this year, uh, ASEAN and the MRC, yeah, uh, they have convened their first so-called water security dialogue. Uh, in other words, they try to initiate this to forge more closer collaboration between the two institutions. In fact, uh, I probably had a hand in, in, in instigating this because way back in the 2008, when I was doing a, a midterm review of the MRC strategic plan, uh, I actually initiated this idea to say, hey, why don't you try to shake hands with ASEAN, meaning addressing to MRC. And each has its own strengths and weaknesses, I think, the Mekong River Commission, of course, as we all know, is a very technical base, uh, river basin, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a focused uh, institution. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I think it, it, is, it suits its purposes. But then I think from a geopolitical point of view, they are rather weak. I mean, if you notice the MRC from the very beginning, the way back in 1957, when there was just a committee, and after so many decades, the composition hasn't changed. It's still four countries as the core, meaning uh, Cambodia, Laos, 
Thailand and Vietnam. Myanmar has never been a member, neither is China, which are riparian members of the Mekong River Commission. Uh, but China, both China and Myanmar are what in the MRC's terminology, dialogue partners, but they are actually observers, okay? Uh, so, so therefore, I sort of initiated way back uh, in 2008 to, to try to bring these two together because there are synergies uh, and ASEAN probably has a much more leverage on, especially on the geopolitical side than the MRC. But we should also tap the MRC's technical expertise to develop credible and transparent and you know, sustainable solutions to the uh, water management issues, which they are supposed to undertake. Okay, next slide, please. So basically, I, I, this is uh, what how the MRC's uh, strategic, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategy uh, that they have been uh, developing over the years, and this is actually their logo: uh, meeting the needs and keeping the balance. And I show this because basically this is the core issue. You know, I mean, there are many, many uh, needs for development, whether it's against poverty, for more trade and in uh, infrastructure connectivity. Uh, and so forth, which is very much needed. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also other important, equally important sector issues on environment, on social, on sustainability, and these two need to balance, okay? So basically, and I think the MRC has captured this in this nice sort of fulcrum or balancing way uh, to say that these two need to be equally uh, treated with equal you know, importance. And this is the trade-off situation that uh, I think all Mekong countries, including the various framework will need to address. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I've uh, listed a few, a lot, quite a bit of uh, sources on links. I won't have time to go through them, but you can go through them if you wish. Uh, in terms of where the ROK, uh, Republic of Korea, has made some inroads or cooperation attempts with them, both the Mekong River Commission, for example, through the Korean Development Institute, KDI or K Water, which is their uh, specialized water ag agencies. And then also the Mekong Institute, uh, which has been the uh, sort of the fund manager of the, the so-called Mekong Korea Cooperation Fund. Okay, so, uh, so you can read through you know, at your leisure and find out more about what ROK is doing with these two key Mekong related institutions. Okay, I go to the next slide, please. Since my time is limited, so I should move on. Um, next slide, yeah. Okay, I just want to show this one because this is a project which is I'm currently involved in uh, and is funded under the Mekong Korea uh, you know, Cooperation Fund, MKCF, and with Mekong Institute as the fund manager, as you can see. Uh, and as you see in the logo, there are two key core institutions involved, the Institute of Asian Studies in Chulalongkorn University uh, on behalf of the Mekong countries, the five Mekong countries, and then the Seoul National University, Asia Center uh, in, from Korean side. Uh, you know, the budget, the time frame is a two year uh, project, which started in April this year. And then uh, the participating countries are basically the five Mekong countries plus Korea, and the proponent uh, and the ROK coordinator, you already already mentioned. Uh, the focus is basically, as we all know, COVID uh, has been around with us for two years now. Uh, and a year ago, uh, actually, this proposal was actually again um, sort of uh, initiated by me uh, because I thought, oh, this is a very, this is becoming a big pandemic, a global issue. Uh, this is going to stay around for a while, and we need to get our good uh, hands on it uh, pretty quickly, yeah? And sure enough, we need to therefore now uh, find ways to collaborate, yeah? especially among uh, the Mekong countries which are affected and so is Korea. And what are the, some uh, lessons learned, best practices or experiences that we can share with each other, we can learn from each other on how we each manage or, or fail to manage uh, uh, the outbreaks and, uh, and the spread. And then we are specifically focusing on migrant worker uh, or labor health issues because you know there are migrant workers in all over Southeast Asia and especially in the Mekong. And interestingly, there are also these five Mekong countries have migrant worker working in Republic of Korea. So 
it's a common issue. It's another transnational issue. And as many of you have also written about, you know, ICT digital technology is becoming the norm these days. Uh, and we and we know that Korea is very advanced in using ICT, especially in COVID management, uh, on tracking, tracing, treatment, and so forth. And so we would also like to learn from each other on this one. So I just use that as an example of what we are doing in the Mekong under the Mekong Korea Corporation. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, these are my, uh, my, my last slide, my final thoughts. Um, basically, my um, observation is our, the ROK is a middle power. Uh, and fortunately, without too much existing baggage as compared to some of the big powers. Uh, so perhaps we can try to devise if there's not yet a strategy, but if there is, then maybe try to fine tune or, uh, and, and strengthen it to how to, uh, for Korea or South Korea in this case, to position itself to play a more catalytic, rich building and connecting the dots role in the Mekong sub-regional uh, scheme of things. Like what I've mentioned in terms of the challenges and opportunities, you know, there's still a lot of just haphazard, siloed kind of frameworks, uh, a lot of overlaps, a lot of duplication, a lot of waste of resources and energy, by the way. So it's not the best. So how can we improve it? All right, and maybe perhaps we need somebody who is uh, not one of those, you know, uh, big powers because obviously they are just saying, uh, you know, they want to do their thing, okay? Uh, but we need to do things more collaboratively, cooperative. And maybe this is also where the Mekong countries and with maybe with a little push from ASEAN at the back, uh, from the, especially the maritime states uh, to, to the Mekong countries to try to initiate something. And I mean, like Vietnam has tried. So this has to be carried through. I hope that with Cambodia chairmanship of ASEAN starting next year, because Cambodia is also a Mekong country, they would pick up on this uh, a little bit more uh, uh, earnestly. Uh, but then, you know, with opportunities and you know so forth, there's also a commensurate expectation of demonstrating responsibility and accountability in the implementation of projects, right? On the part of the funders, developers and consumers. Uh, I put a link there. Uh, I think uh, for some of you, you may know that there was a dam collapse in one of the, you know, uh, sort of tributaries of the, the Mekong and caused a lot of damages and flooding and so forth. And interestingly, it has uh, both, uh, you know, mainland Southeast Asia as well as Korean connection, okay, into this project. So I think that's why I put it up there. Uh, and then, of course, as I said, the Mekong countries themselves have to get their act together a bit more seriously to develop more common positions on key areas of shared interest. Uh, the, the rest are basically more or less normative, but I think it's worth uh, you know, noting and also repeating in that we need to have uh, addressed these common issues in an integrated collective manner, okay? Uh, strike the right balance, you know, meeting the needs and keeping the balance as the MRC tried to achieve. Uh, balancing between national and regional interests, and also to provide conducive environment. You know, we need to develop trust. I mean, cooperation can only work if there's enough confidence and trust in each other. Uh, so we need to, diplomacy has to, to come in here very seriously and dialogue has to take place, okay? Uh, and then we need to manage trade-offs because we can't have everything. Nobody can have everything in such collaborative uh, endeavors. So we need to figure a scheme to share the benefits and the costs equitably, you know, more fairly, more sustainably, more inclusively, okay? And then to find mutual interest for joint solution to problem. Like, you know, the COVID, like what I've been proposing to do in the, uh, the COVID in the Mekong and Korea. And to, you know, find ways to, dis, uh, to uh, dis, uh, resolve disputes or anything. Start with the low hanging fruits and early harvest, okay? <coughs> Don't start with the difficult ones. Start with the more easier ones. <clears throat> and if you are uh, you know, a literature fan of some of the novelists, like English uh, novelist Jane Austen, uh, you will know that she wrote two very important of her works is Pride and Prejudice, which I think we should have less. <laughs> and then we should have more Sense and Sensibility, which is uh, the other title of novel. Okay, that's all I have. So I'd be happy to answer entertaining questions. And I have a final slide, which is my email. So anybody who wants to write to me, you can please do so. Can you share the fire? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Very easy. Happy Chai underscore SUN Sun at yahoo.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Apichai. It was indeed a good opportunity for students to gain quick overview of the issues and opportunities for sustainable development in the Mekong region. At this time, I would like to invite participants to raise questions. Please use the hand raising icon. Or is there anyone who is unfamiliar with the Zoom system? All right, um, but I have, I have several questions received in a private message. Let's go through with these questions first. And if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hands in the Zoom. Uh, Mr. Apichai, I have about three questions. Will this be fine with you? Okay, the first question is, what are, the, what are some of the initiatives that ASEAN and Korea are working together on to address the issue of climate change or sustainable development in Mekong region? This is the first question. Okay, should I take that first or? Um, yeah, we can go one by one, no problem. Okay, on the climate thing, I mean, I think uh, it's becoming a very uh, you know, common uh, sort of agenda now, eh? especially with uh, global climate uh, you know, situation and, and so forth. So I think the, most of the cooperation framework, I think, would address it, okay? I mean, I, I don't have the details, but I think major, all the major frameworks, as far as I know, uh, would more or less, I mean, it would be very unusual to not address this, uh, this issue, isn't it? Uh, because it's actually another, just like COVID, uh, and some people are already saying that if you think COVID is bad, uh, wait you see the full effects of the climate change, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, emerging or pulling itself out. And for example, Philippines just had a very, very big typhoon. Huh? Huh? Uh, last year, there were many countries with severe drought, heat waves, or hurricanes, or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, these are already growing signs of uh, climate or the weather is uh, going a little bit wacky, <laughs> you know, so, and then you can expect more of that coming. So I think uh, there's, of course, even in ASEAN and in Mekong country frameworks, a lot of attention now put into this. Uh, but I think still what is lacking is still, you know, it doesn't gel. I mean, just like I was telling you, um, each one doing their own and thing, you know, uh, and they're not connecting the dots. That's why I say, you know, there needs to be a bridge builder. There needs to be a connecting the dot. There needs to be an integrator. I mean, just like an orchestra. You need a conductor to make sure that the music is harmonized, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it's playing and then it's just noise, okay? So you need to play a nice narrative of music that comes out. So this is the same as with Mekong or with climate or with any, any sector. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. I think you have well answered the questions. We have well understood that the issues we have in the region is to connect the dots, like silo effects as you discussed in the presentation. And the second question is the climate change and sustainable development is a challenge for all countries. Why is it especially important for the issues in the Mekong countries to be addressed? Mr. Apichai? Well, uh, not just the American countries, I think you know, the whole world needs to address it, you know, and every sector of society. Um, I mean, well, uh, let's put it this way. Um, it's a global issue, just like the pandemic is, all right, even more so. And I think it needs the whole of society, whole of government, whole of everything to, to really put our heads together and act in unison, all right? Now, I'm very glad that I'm in this webinar because a lot of you are youth, younger generation, not like me. I'm already sort of retired, semi-retired on the way out, so to speak. Uh, but I think we also have a lot of knowledge and wisdom that we can pass on if we want to, or you would like to hear about it, all right? For example, just now I heard one of the essay topics were a tale of two contents or something like that, right? Uh, somebody used the, the tale of two locales. Uh, actually, I have made a recording of a tale of two pandemics. If you'd like to hear it, you can just write me an email and I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, so what I want to say is that uh, youth and younger generation is very important because they are the, the future. They have to you know, live with the future much more longer than people like myself. Uh, so I think together we have to uh, 
uh, work together. In fact, uh, I would like to, uh, maybe, I don't know, anybody have uh, read the Book of Hope by Jane Goodall and Douglas Abrams, which just came out this year. Yeah, I'll show you this, if you can't see too well. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, you, you know, you just uh, Google the Book of Hope uh, and then you'll come up. Uh, it's, it's the subtitle is A Survival Guide for Trying Times. Okay, Jane Goodall, for those who don't know, is a primatologist. She studies chimpanzees, you know, as a career. Uh, and she's basically an environmentalist, naturalist, and so forth. And I think it's interesting that she's already already in the 80s, okay? Uh, at least 20 years older than me. Uh, but yet, she writes a book of hope together with her co-author, Dr. Abrams, because she still has hope. But you say, oh, despite all the bloom and gloom and whatever in the nature, biodiversity loss, climate change coming, why is she so hopeful? And I think there are a few things that uh, I'd just like to share, you know, in terms of why she thinks so. Uh, in other words, the amazing human intellect, yeah? If people like us can send pe uh, you know, people to the moon, go to Mars, and uh, do all sorts of you know, the cloud computing and everything like that. And, and, and of course the, the medicines and vaccines and so forth. So we, we do have intellect, yeah? But it has to be harnessed and used properly, okay? And decisively and, and timely. And then the second reason she's hopeful is that the resilience of nature. I mean, nature, despite all the uh, as, uh, pollution and all the things that uh, we treat it very badly, but if you allow it to to regenerate, it will. I mean, just look at COVID, right? We had to be locked down and things. The the the, the, the sky got clearer, the air got cleaner, the, the the trees and the animals start to come back. Okay, so there is this resilience in nature up to a certain point, of course. Before, you, otherwise, you will, you know, then it might be gone. And then the third one, which is very relevant to this group, is the power of young people. Okay? Just like me, I think I recognize the power of young people. Of course, it has to be utilized and wielded properly. Okay? And then finally, she said the indomitable human spirit. In other words, the human spirit can do many things. It can build, you know, uh, you know, uh, what do you call this? You know, from the pyramid time, the Great Wall and things. You know, even in those days, they were able to build big things. I mean, so can we now, all right? And so this is what it, the Book of Hope is about. So maybe you could take a look at it too, yeah? And this is, I hope, you know, a way to, to, to engender and to energize people to work together more collaboratively. I Thank hope you. I've answered that one too. <laughs> I think perfect answer for this second question. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree with you because as we are here together, the young students being interested with the issues around the, the sustainable development, especially in the Mekong regions as well as ASEAN region. So I'm happy that we are given a chance to hear from you, also hear from our students. And the last question is, what sectors and areas do you think should be prioritized when addressing the issue of climate change or sustainable development in the Mekong region? Well, again, not just the Mekong, but I think it's worldwide because it affects everybody else. We all have to do our part, yeah? Uh, rich and poor, east and west, north, south, yeah? Uh, th th this is global problem. And therefore, I think it comes back to, you know, I, I, I have been a freelance consultant for the last 10 years. Uh, so working projects on Mekong, on ASEAN, on UN, or, you know, you name it, as sustainable development goal, climate change and whatnot. Uh, so I've been quite busy actually, uh, even in my uh, this capacity. So I'm gonna take next year off from my usual routine, okay? Partly because I want to spend more time with family, because which I have not been able to do during my busy. Uh, handling projects 24 hours a day sometimes. Uh, and then also to have time with friends, family, and also do some travel wherever possible, all right? And also to really examine the issue of what this so-called, we, we now have this phrase called the new normal, right? As a result of the COVID pandemic. So what is this new normal? What does it entail? What change do we have to make? To me, myself, Personally, 
you know, how should I live my life different, meaning from the old normal, right? Because I see even in where I live in Bangkok, now with the opening up and people start returning back to the old normal is what they think is desired. But to me, I think that's going down the wrong path because that was the problem that caused the pandemic in the first place, so to, so to speak, you know? <laughs> we didn't get our act right. How come a virus which has no brains can up in the whole world? And uh, of course, we are trying to rectify and trying to address it now, you know? How can it so easily, you know, sort of upset the whole world system? That means something wrong with the whole the world system, <laughs> whether it's natural or not, right? So then what, what needs to be rectified? Or in order to have the, the hope that Jane Goodall is talking about, okay? So it has to come back to each individual, each community, each society, each country, and then hopefully the whole world. So this community of nations effort has to be the ultimate, you know, aim and target of our endeavor. Okay. Or this new normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Mr. Apichai. Um, for the last question, you speak as a lecturer and as a father. <laughs> thank you for your <laughs> well, kind <whatever>. words. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Our next lecture it will be about strengthening ASEAN-Korea partnership in overcoming COVID-19 and building back better for greater prosperity in the region. I'd, I would like to invite Ambassador Chung Hae Moon the former Secretary General of ASEAN Korea Center and also former Ambassador of Korea to Thailand. With his rich experience in foreign affairs, Ambassador Chung will share with us his views on the challenges posed by the current pandemic and what opportunities it can offer in strengthening the partnership between ASEAN and Korea. Please welcome Ambassador Chung with a round of applause. Uh, let me uh, also join the previous speakers uh, in extending my warm welcome to the winners of 2021 ASEAN Korea Academic Essay Contest. Let me also express many thanks to all the other participants who have made great contributions by uh, participating in big numbers. And today, uh, I'll cover eight uh, main areas, but uh, since uh, the previous speaker covered extensively on the climate change issues, depending upon the availability of time, I may skip on that part. But other than, uh, I'll uh, start with the major policy initiative by both sides, okay? Here, uh, I just listed uh, six very important uh, foreign policy initiatives taken by ASEAN and Korea. The first is AOIP. I'm sure you are familiar with that concept. And ACLF and MPAC 2025, NSP and its uh, upgraded version NSP uh, Plus. And ASEAN allocate strategic partnership Finally, Mekong allocate strategic partnership. Okay. I think I want to emphasize, uh, you know, before I uh, go into detail about the importance of uh, the three issues interconnected. The uh, health security and uh, the uh, you know, health security, okay. Digital transformation and climate change. These three issues are the issues that define our era, our moment. These three issues are more or less closely uh, interrelated. But if, if you are asked to cite the three most important issues facing the world today. I think I'm not hesitant to cite these three issues interconnected together. Okay. Uh, 
In terms of health security, I think Korea ASEAN have maintained a very good uh, collaboration. And during the recent uh, ROK uh, ASEAN summit, President Moon proposed the establishment of ROK ASEAN health and the vaccine cooperation cooperation initiative. This initiative will uh, allow Korea to further collaborate with ASEAN in increasing our vaccine and the therapeutics manufacturing capacities and bring Korea's overall healthcare partnership with ASEAN to a new level. One major progress to note is the launch of ROK ASEAN Health Ministers meeting. The first meeting will be held next year it will serve as a venue for Korea and ASEAN to provide inclusive health cooperation method that can continue beyond the post-COVID era. Okay. And now, digital transformation. I think Korea and ASEAN have been a good partner in terms of uh, sharing information uh, regarding digital uh, transformation. Okay. Korea ASEAN cooperation, let's look at uh, what cooperation we have maintained. Given the high percentage of young people and the growing number of online access in the ASEAN region, the digital economy is expected to be a key driver in the region's growth. And Korea will help accelerate and fully realize the potential of digital economy in ASEAN. Already, Korea and ASEAN are working together on 5G and open data project and cross-cutting different sectors. The Korean government supports ASEAN's digital capacity in such as smart cities, government disaster management, online education, digital contents, and e-health, and will utilize platforms such as the ICT Convergence village to create the new contents and evolve our collaboration in this area. The digital economy is driving the region's growth. Indeed, ASEAN's digital economy is expected to account for 8.5% of the total GDP in 2025, increasing from 1.3% from the figure in 2015. Especially amid the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an explosive increase in the call for digital transformation. Okay. In terms of uh, climate change response and uh, green growth, how Korea and ASEAN have maintained the cooperations? Uh, first, Understanding the impact of climate change in the ASEAN region, Korea has activated a tailor-made cooperation project in the area of climate change response and green recovery, and have launched the ASEAN ROK Dialogue on Environment and Climate Change this year as a, a platform to continue our conversation. This was initiated this year. Korea ASEAN countries can be most promising partner for cooperation in the field of climate change and green growth. Southeast Asia is one of the most vulnerable regions to the impact of climate change, and Korea is also keen to climate issues by announcing 2050 carbon neutrality, Green New Deal policies, and this year advancing environmental cooperation under the NSP+. Okay. Several areas of cooperation for climate change between Korea and ASEAN. One area is to accelerate Korea-ASEAN dialogue with particular emphasis on carbon market. Another area is smart city development. Through digitalization, we can make decarbonization. Energy infrastructure, transport systems, disaster monitoring technologies can be included in cooperation for smart city development, which is a new engine for green growth. Another new engine for green growth is the waste management, 
and utilization in the context of circular economy. Okay. Now, let me uh, discuss the uh, interrelationship among the AOIP and Korea's NSP Plus and ASEAN Comprehensive uh, Recovery Framework. Uh, basically, what I wanted to do is to combine some element of those three foreign policy initiatives and then show you what specifically we can do to combine those three elements for further enhancing the relationship between Korea and ASEAN, okay? As you know, the NSP Plus has seven key areas, but this year, the government has included the environmental issues as additional items. So it could be now eight. You know. And then AOIP. AOIP means uh, ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific. AOIP has four cooperation areas, okay? Realizing the U.S. SDG, connectivity, economic, and other areas of cooperation and maritime cooperation. And ACRF, uh, that is the abbreviation of ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery uh, Framework, all right? It has five broad uh, strategies. And now, what uh, we can do is to build a people-oriented, people-centered community of peace and prosperity. As this is uh, NSP's goal as well as uh, ASEAN community's goal. So we are combining the NSP's goal with the, the ASEAN community's goal. This really indicates uh, the degree of partnership between Korea and the ASEAN, okay? Here, uh, let me uh, uh, explain to you the three you know, pillars that uh, underpin the NSP as well as uh, ASEAN community. Three P, first P is people and prosperity and, and peace. So these three P's constitute the pillars underpinning Korea's NSP Plus strategy as well as ASEAN communities, okay? So I listed uh, several uh, important uh, elements uh, where Korea and ASEAN can cooperate. Uh, under the heading of the people, we have a very important uh, you know, element and issues to be uh, covered in the partnership cooperation between Korea and uh, ASEAN, okay? And uh, the second pillar is uh, prosperity. This prosperity uh, has a lot uh, to do with the digital economy because digital economy is supposed to be the level of the new growth, okay? And then, Third pillar is peace. Here, let me stand. Okay. And so third pillar is peace, is maritime security and safety cooperation, and marine sustainability, marine plastic debris. These are the new concepts constituting elements of non traditional security issues. You know, ASEAN is divided into two parts. One is uh, the maritime part of ASEAN, the other one is continental part of ASEAN. So in terms of the marine plastic debris, I think this is uh, the concerns of those countries belonging to the ocean part of the ASEAN. So people, prosperity, P's. These three P's are the main pillars buttressing the NSB Plus strategy as well as uh, ASEAN uh, community, okay? 
And now, I want to talk about uh, international development cooperation based on ICT. I think develop, international development cooperation in Southeast Asia is very, very important. Uh, up, up to 15 countries are now engaged in providing development cooperation to countries of ASEAN region. Okay. Here, Korea's uh, ICT can make a real difference. Okay. I think Korea can uh, contribute a lot. Okay. And uh, in terms of the scale and the level, I think Korea's uh, ODA to ASEAN country is almost 30.5%. Uh, so ASEAN is also very, very important in terms of Korea's contribution of ODA. Okay. And amazingly, on uh, May 21st of this year, President Biden and President Moon issued a joint statement where the trilateral development cooperation toward Southeast Asia region has featured prominently. So now, Korea, United States, and uh, a member country of ASEAN trilaterally, trilaterally can cooperate to enhance international development cooperation, particularly based upon ICT. And I think this indicates a lot about uh, the importance of trilateral you know, development cooperation toward the ASEAN, okay? And now, I think uh, it will not be uh, enough if I do not cover trade and investment cooperation between Korea and ASEAN. Trade and investment cooperation has been a uh, main bulwark of cooperation between Korea and ASEAN. In terms of uh, uh, trade, I think uh, RCEP is coming into force for most of ASEAN countries. But in the case of Korea, the RCEP will come into force from 1st of February this year, next year. All right? Here. You see, Korea ASEAN FTA, Korea Singapore, Korea Vietnam FTA, which have been already, you know, in force. Uh, it has been already in several years. But negotiations for FTA completed with Indonesia, Philippines, Cambodia, Malaysia. Okay, but multilaterally, RCEP is about to be uh, launched in a couple of months' time, and CPP, CPTPP, TPP. RCEP accounts for 29.5% of world GDP, okay? While making up 25.4% of global trade. In the case of CPTPP accounts for 12.8% of world GDP, while constituting 15.2% of world trade. You know, you may be wondering, what is CPTPP and uh, what, what is uh, TPP? Actually, CPTPP is TPP minus. TPP minus United States. You know, what was the first executive action Donald Trump has taken since he came to White House? The first executive action President Trump enacted was to withdraw the United States from the TPP. So other than the United States, all 11 countries with the initiative of Japan, they have uh, launched CPTPP. So whether the TPP will be able to reborn, it depends. Okay. See, this shows uh, the countries joining CPTPP. Other than the United States, all the 11 countries along the Pacific Rim. All right? This is uh, 15 countries uh, joining RCEP. But in the case of India, 
who opted out at the last minute. I think, depending upon you know the circumstance, India may be lured back into the fold. All right. And this is uh, you know Trans-Pacific Partnership (TPP). The country is uh, that would have uh, joined the TPP. All right. This indicates the expected impact of RCEP on real incomes. In the case of Japan and South Korea, I think the real uh, income can uh, increase up to one percent. You know by. 2020 to 2030. I think uh, this was prepared by the Economist magazine, so it's quite credible, I believe. It's quite credible. Okay. All right. And now, just uh, for the interest of uh, your understanding, I outline you know, how much importance uh, the Korean government, the Korean people have attached to the partnership between uh, Korea and ASEAN. I just want to show you some of the institutions that has been uh, uh, enacted in order to uh, strengthen the relations between Korea and ASEAN. The first one is ASEAN Affairs Bureau, MOFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as far as I know, Korea is the only non-ASEAN member countries uh, which has uh, independent, uh, you know, ASEAN Affairs Bureau in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Presidential Committee on Nas uh, New Southern Policies, Korea, uh, ASEAN Korea Center, ASEAN Culture Center in Gwangju, ASEAN Culture House in Busan, ASEAN Culture Center in Bangkok, ASEAN Korea Business Council, ASEAN Allocate Financial Cooperation Center, which has just uh, started its business in Jakarta. Okay? ASEAN Allocate ICT Convergence Village in Busan is to be established. Okay? ASEAN Korea Standardization Joint Research Centers to be established. ASEAN Allocate Science and Technology Cooperation Centers to be established. And also we have Korea ASEAN Cooperation Fund, Korea Mekong Cooperation Fund, BIMP Eager Allocate Cooperation Fund. So this indicates, you know, this shows the commitment of Korean government, the Korean people, to uh, bolstering the cooperation between Korea and ASEAN. Okay. So with this, uh, I conclude uh, my presentation. I hope that. Uh, you may have learned something about uh, the level of commitment the Korean government has shown to enhancing the bilateral relations between Korea and ASEAN. And uh, if you have any question, I will be delighted to entertain some of them. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Please remain stand for the questions. We have about two questions from the private message. Um, and I would like, I'm going to go one on one. So. Yes, yes. The first question is that you have touched upon many sectors, and among them, what area or sector do you think is the main priority that ASEAN should pursue with Korea to ensure a sustainable recovery from pandemic? Sustainable recovery. From the yeah, COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Let me see. I think uh, Korea and ASEAN have been uh, very, very good in terms of uh, cooperation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, resolutions. And uh, ASEAN has established the ASEAN Response Fund, ASEAN uh, COVID-19 Response Fund. I think Korea has contributed uh, 6 million uh, US dollars to, uh, to that. And also, uh, Korea ASEAN uh, is going to inaugurate, as I explained, the first uh, Korea ASEAN Health Ministerial meetings. That will be the first meeting of that the ministerial meeting will be held 
uh, sooner, earlier next year. And Korea will, will try to serve as a hub of vaccine and therapeutics. So in this regard, I think Korea will be uh, able to closely cooperate with ASEAN in terms of enhancing the uh, equality of uh, vaccine provisions and sharing the therapeutics with the ASEAN member countries. Okay? Will it be all right? Did I satisfy your question? Guys, are you satisfied with the answer? Oh, someone was like nodding this hard. <laughs> yeah, the second question okay. is that, how do you think the young generation can contribute to strengthening the partnership between ASEAN and Korea in overcoming the pandemic and building back better? I think uh, here in Korea, the visibility of uh, ASEAN has been enhanced uh, significantly. And uh, young people are motivated to do you know, whatever they can to enhance the visibility of ASEAN because they came to know, they came to understand that ASEAN has become very important to the lives and the livelihood of uh, Korean people. So as we witnessed uh, the winning of the prize you know, this afternoon, I believe the, uh, the trend for youth power to contribute the uh, communication will be all the more important. There is a widespread perception that uh, the users of Korea can continue to uh, contribute their share of responsibilities to uh, enhance Korean and ASEAN uh, cooperation. And uh, you know, since the beginning of the COVID-19, I think Korea and ASEAN have maintained an excellent level of cooperation, uh, firstly by providing the important uh, equipment. Uh, and now, since Korea has been uh, aiming to, to become a a uh, vaccine hub, I think that will as well ensure that uh, the cooperation between Korea and ASEAN on the question of the vaccine uh, provision will be further enhanced. Okay. Thank you. Will it be all right? Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Ambassador. Okay. So. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, despite the short time, you have provided us with a very comprehensive overview of the ASEAN and Korea partnership, as well as the foundation of the New Southern Policy Plus. Thank you, and thank you again for the two esteemed lecturers once again, and I would like to thank our two speakers for their insightful lectures. Um, now we have come to the end of today's event. I hope you all enjoy taking part in the contest and also in attending today's webinar. Before you leave, we would greatly appreciate if you could fill out our survey, which is now being shared in the chat box. Your feedback will help us make our program more meaningful in the years to come. I believe the survey is already shared in the chat box. Perfect. Right. Lastly, please follow and subscribe to the ASEAN Korea Center's channels on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you, and we hope to see you again in our future events.